pranams to gurudev chirmananda ji whose birthday falls today without gurudev these kind of vedanta discussions might not have been possible in public namaste to everyone we at advaita academy welcome you all to this one month long oneness festival a global celebration of adi shankaracharya ji in this session we have something very different this is a dialogue on shankara which will be a conversation between gayatri ayer ji and professor makaran paranj peji professor makaran paranj peji author poet editor is the director of indian institute of advanced shimla prior to which he was a professor of english at the jawahar lal nehru university new delhi for more than 20 years he is the author of more than 20 books among which is the latest swami vivekananda hinduism and india's road to modernity he also writes columns for the open magazine mail today and the print gayatri ayer ji is the curator of indica pictures and a contributing writer for indica as a budding yoga teacher in the tradition of t krishnamacharya ji her interests lie in understanding what it means to be on the path of yoga you may please type in your comments and questions in the chat below thank you thank you kavita ji and also hari kiran ji uh, the curator and uh, the brains behind this festival for giving us an opportunity and coincidentally it's so wonderful that today is swami ji's uh, birth anniversary also so you know without any further delay i am very excited about this dialogue and a lot of questions are bubbling in my head so i would start with really understanding that why should we know about shankara today i mean this whole global festival of oneness a one month festival has been curated and is being watched all over the world so there must be something that is relevant about him even today so makranji can you please enumerate on this thank you thank you it's wonderful that today is swami chinmananda's birthday and somebody said it's also narad jayanti and yesterday was you know buddha purnima so these are extremely auspicious times for us to talk about these great figures particularly shankaracharya i will come back to the connection with swami chinmananda later but just behind me you see a portrait of uh, one of our great modern philosophers as well as one of our presidents dr sarvapalli radhakrishnan uh, i refer to him because uh, he founded the indian institute of advanced study shimla uh, in 1965 and uh, you know this building was the vice regal lodge it was a part of the president's estate but uh, you know president radhakrishnan believed that uh, it should be put to better uses in fact he found that uh, the president hardly spent time here and therefore he thought he'd make an, a modern academy where scholars from all over the world but certainly from india could come and stay here and do serious research now the point i'm trying to make is that there is a direct connection between what president radhakrishnan wanted to accomplish and what shankaracharya did which is to strengthen india's intellectual traditions and if you think about dr radhakrishnan himself he began uh, his life uh, his intellectual life in madras christian college as a student of philosophy and uh, uh, when he was there he was struck by something he says in one of his reminiscences about his student days i'm quoting him the challenge of christian critics impelled me to make a study of hinduism and find out what is living and what is dead in it my pride as a hindu roused by the enterprise and eloquence of swami vivekananda was deeply hurt by the treatment accorded to hinduism in missionary institutions so what did president radhakrishnan do for his ma thesis he wrote a dissertation on the ethics of vedanta and its metaphysical presuppositions the ethics of vedanta it directly links him with shankara and the defense of hinduism directly links him with shankara because it was shankara who defended hinduism who organized hinduism we'll come to that in a moment 
and uh, his setting up of this institute uh, where he wanted scholars to deeply study not just Hinduism, of course, but all kinds of modern uh, thinking and uh, including sciences was very much a part of the tradition of Shankara, which was to vitalize India's intellectual traditions. So the point I'm trying to make really is that there is a Shankara in all of us, even if we don't know it. And Shankara has influenced the life of every modern Indian, I would say, particularly every Hindu all over the world. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But uh, to come back to uh, Radhakrishnan just for a moment, his entire understanding of Vedanta was obviously influenced by his reading of Shankara, as well as his commentaries on the Upanishads, which were in that same Shankara tradition, because it was Shankara who said that it was prasthana trai that we have to study if you have to understand Hinduism. So what was prasthana trai? One was the Upanishads, which, which was the, you know, the, the Shruti Pramana, and then it was the Brahma Sutras you have to study, and Shankara wrote commentaries on the Upanishads and the Brahma Sutras, which he called, you know, a part of the, uh, you know, Yukti Pramana of our tradition. That is, Yukti is not just joining, but it's dialectics. It's the, should I say, the knack, you know, the intelligent understanding of texts. Why is that important? Why is Yukti important? Because unless you have that Yukti, which is the, uh, the trick, as it were, to understand these deep texts, which are scriptural texts, you won't be liberated. So Shankara is teaching you that. That's why Shankara is important. He's teaching you the art of liberation. But we'll again come back to that in a moment. And the third part was the Bhagavad Gita, which was the sadhana paksha, the sadhana part of the Prasthanatrayi. And if you look at Dr. Radhakrishnan's own intellectual journey, then he's commented on all these aspects, you know, of Hinduism, when he wrote the Hindu view of life and his numerous books. So in other words, the foundation of the intellectual career of a person, great modern philosopher like Dr. Radhakrishnan, was the work of Shankara. And another interesting, uh, you know, aspect of this whole journey was that what was Dr. Radhakrishnan trying to do? He was trying to give a modern interpretation of Vedanta. So one of the uh, charges, one of the allegations against Shankara is, oh, he's a Mayavadi. And he, uh, that is Dr. Radhakrishnan, tried to reinterpret uh, Shankara's doctrine of Maya in a slightly different way as the subjective understanding of the universe, which is different from the ultimate reality. Because in Brahma Sutra Bhashas, what is it that Shankara is saying? He's saying the universe is adhyasa, it's a superimposition on Brahman. Again, we can come back to that. So what I'm, what I'm simply trying to say is that our self-understanding as Hindus owes so much to Shankara. And you know, Radhakrishnanji mentioned Swami Vivekananda. Whenever you see that Ananda added to a name, the Swami or the sannyasi referred to belongs to the Dashanami tradition of sannyasa. So Brahmananda, Chinmayananda, Shivananda. Shivananda was the guru of Swami Chinmayananda. So this, this whole order of the Hindu monks was established by Shankara. So you have Giri, Puri, Parvata, Aranyaka, Vana, Sagara, etc. This order of Hindu sannyasis, which were called the Ekadandins. So they used to carry one stick. It's very interesting how, you know, talking about sticks, earlier sannyasis and others, aghoris also, babas, they carry tridents. But what Shankara said is, you know, uh, uh, you know, if you even looked at our great Shankaracharyas, like our, uh, you know, the great, uh, uh, you know, Periya Swami of, uh, of Kanchimat, you know, all of them carried a very thin bamboo stick. So the point is you don't defend Hinduism necessarily by carrying a trident or an axe like Parshurama. But with the stick of your intellect, you know, you can really uphold this great civilization, which is Hindu dharma. But let's not forget that uh, sometime in the 16th century, it is believed that because Hindu monks were being, and pilgrims were being subjected to a lot of 
uh, trouble by the invaders who had established themselves, uh, uh, an order, the Akhadas were started, you know, by a great, uh, again, uh, part of the Shankara tradition, one of the 10 orders, he started, uh, you know, the Akhadas and of the Naga Baba. So these Akhadas were meant to defend uh, Hinduism, defend pilgrims with weapons if required. And the Akhada is a place where people wrestle. So these Akhadas were formed all over India by this great, uh, uh, you know, uh, this great saint uh, in the 16th century. And, uh, and that is how even today, if you think about, uh, uh, you know, and his name was, his name was Madhusudana Saraswati. So even the word Saraswati, like Ananda, Giri, means they belong to the Dashanami. And so was Dayan and Saraswati. Again, we'll come back to him. So here's the point. When Madhusudana Saraswati organized uh, militant sadhus, he, instead of the mathas, he created the Akhara system. And now we saw the lynching of the Swamis in Palghar. They belong to the Juna Akhara. If you go to a Kumbh Mela, the Juna Akhara has the primary status they go for the Shahi Snan, the royal bath. They are the first ones. They are on top of it. And then the Nirankari Akhada, Niranjani Akhada, Anand Akhada, etc. So these Juna Akhada sadhus who were killed belong to the highest of these Akhadas, which were also part of the tradition of Shankaracharya. Now, just, just to come back to these great reformers of modern Hinduism, Look at Swami Dayan and Saraswati. In a way, he gave up his, uh, not entirely, but quite a bit, the Shankara tradition uh, by not emphasizing the Prasthana Trai so much as the Vedas, which were considered Karmakanda. He said, go back to the Vedas. But what was his lineage? He was a Saraswati. So he belonged to the same lineage that Shankara had established. Look at... Uh, Swami Vivekananda, probably the greatest figure in modern Hinduism. His guru, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, was initiated into Sannyasa Diksha by none other than a Swami who belonged to the Shankara, uh, you know, the Dasha, uh, you know, Nami, uh, the, 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 you know, sa, you know, order. His name was Totapuri, and he was a Sannyasi who had come uh, to the banks of the Ganga all the way from the hills of the Punjab. And he initiated uh, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, who initiated Swami Vivekananda and his brother disciples. So you see, whenever there is a defense of Hinduism, Shankaracharya or his tradition is important. Whenever there's a reformation of Hinduism, Shankaracharya and his lineage is important. Whenever there is a reorganization of Hinduism, Shankaracharya and his heritage is important. And you can even link it to those who broke away from Shankara, like take the great Ramanujan uh, Acharya of, again, from, from the South. And he called Shankara Prachanna Buddha, Buddha. So he said he's like a crypto Buddhist. And anyhow, he started Vashishta Advaita. So, Either you uphold the Shankara tradition, as in modern times, Swami Chinmayananda or Swami Vivekananda, others did, or you break away, as uh, the great Ramanujam did. And he founded his own tradition of sannyasa as well, Vaishnava sannyasis, or even the Madhava tradition. If you go to an ISKCON temple, you know, there from Prabhupada, before that, if you, if you trace the heritage, it goes back to Madhava. Madhavacharya, who also comes from the south. Now, they broke away from uh, Shankara's tradition, but in debating with Shankara, they enriched the tradition of Advaita. You know? So when we talk about Iskon, we say Bhakti Vedanta. So they're combining Bhakti and Vedanta. You see? Now, I'll tell you one more interesting thing. If you look at uh, you know, many of the families of Brahmins in India, they are divided into Pancha Gauda or Pancha Dakshina. Uh, now look at you. you. You are an Iyar, right, Gayatri? 
So you'll find if you, if you trace your uh, family history, your Acharyas would belong to a Shankar Mat, probably Kanchi Mat. You know, I come from Maharashtra. I'm what is called a Chitpavan. And uh, my family owes its uh, allegiance. Our Acharyas come from the Trambakeshwar Mat. You know, there's a great Jyotirlinga there, Shiva Temple, near Nasik, Trambakeshwar. There's a river, beautiful river. So uh, in my Upanayanam ceremony, a Swamiji showed up, you know, and said, I have to, you know, uh, uh, be here for this child who belongs to, you know, our tradition. So as we grow older, we don't, we stop doing things. We may not do Sandhya Vandanam. It doesn't matter beyond a point. Actually, it does matter, but let's not get into that. But, but the point is, the point is that whatever we do today is one way or, or the other influenced by Shankar. I'll give you one more little example. When you saw the program, you know, it started with Tatvamasi. So when Shankara established his mats, you know, each mat was given one Mahavakya. You know, for example, Tatvamasi, Iyamatma Brahma, Aham Brahmasmi, etc. Four Mahavakyas, you know. Um, uh, and this Mahavakya, Tatvamasi, which, which Indic Academy, Advaita Academy is using, actually belongs to the Dwarka mat of the Shankaracharya, of the West where Hastamlaka is supposed to have gone and established that mat. So we'll come to, come to that in a moment. So I'm saying many things we do today are unconsciously influenced by Shankara. I'll give you one more example. You go to any Hindu temple, okay? Almost any temple. You know, in Delhi, we organize, uh, you know, this uh, kind of uh, Preeti Bhojan for everyone from JNU, the laborers, everyone. We all go and sit together and we organize this prasadam, usually at the Jagannath Mandir, right? Now the Jagannath Mandir in Puri, one of the Char Dhams of, of course there is a Jagannath, I mean there's a Puri ashram of the Shankaracharya, the, that's a different matter, but the Jagannath Mandir is a Vaishnav Mandir, okay? But if you go to this temple, you will see the main shrine is of course Jagannath, Balabhadra, and, and uh, Subhadra, that is, it's a, uh, it's a shrine to fraternal, that is to brothers and sisters, okay? But as you enter, you'll see a Ganesha. On the side, you'll see a Shivalinga. On another side, you'll see a Devi. Now, how is it that all Hindus, in one way or another, okay, of course they worship, of course they, you know, go back to the Vedas, etc., etc. But they all worship the following deities or forms of that. Shiva, you know, uh, Parvati or the great goddess, Shakti, Ganesh, Kartikeya, or Vishnu or Surya, you see. Now, who did, who organized the different uh, sects of Hinduism so that they could all come together under one umbrella of deity worship? It was Shankara. So when we say, we talk about our heritage, you know, you, you can say, oh, we are smartas, but Actually, we are, we are Shrauta Smartas. In other words, we accept the Shruti, Pramana, and the Smriti, right? And it is Shankara who, who unified Hinduism, who brought us all together and under this umbrella. And therefore, when you say, why does Shankara matter? Shankara matters in many more ways than we can imagine. He's already a part of our consciousness and in our daily rituals, we may not remember him. But the kind of Hinduism we practice today owes an immense amount to Shankara. And whenever there is a defense of Hinduism or of Indian intellectual traditions, it is the lineage of Shankara that plays a great role. And even the Acharyas who differed from him and started their own Sampradaya enriched Advaita, enriched Vedanta, and together made up the Grand Symphony that is Hinduism. Wow. Um, so I'm hearing a couple of words related to who is Shankara, the reformer, the modernist, a human being, a saint. So I mean, there's so many adjectives to describe Shankara. So now I come to the question, who is Shankara? You know, so, can you define him in, this, in so many ways, like you've already done, but 
can you give us something more about maybe a little bit of the human part of his right and also the historic part and the intellectual part so 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 gayatri when you say who is shankara in a way that takes you to the heart of shankara's project because at the highest level if you want to understand who is shankara you have to ask who am i you know and uh, you know as swami dayanand saraswati another great uh, modern teacher of vedanta and advaita uh, once told me uh, in an in a nice conversation we had he said that vedanta is always expressed in equations so there is one side is me you know aham the other side is something else so unless you understand the equation aham brahmasmi or tattva masi you cannot understand who you are and if you don't understand who you are or you don't understand the nature of consciousness the nature of the world the nature of birth and death so called samsara how can you understand shankara so let me let me say that who is shankara can be understood or addressed or approached at the metaphysical level but as you said what about the human level okay now that's a wonderful uh, question because the truth is from a modern historical perspective because remember that till a few hundred years ago even the west wasn't very particular about history even for them what was real was legends and myths and stories uh, and uh, in fact if you think about the form of the novel and a great book on the novel if you're interested is called the rise of the novel by ian watt and he basically says the novel replaces the romance with the rise of history and individuality and capitalism and the bourgeoisie where you need an accurate one on one correspondence with the external world you know where you have to define things and enumerate things prior to that the tradition of literature even in the west was what was called romance you know what the persians would call dastan in india we had you know dashakumara charitra or you had uh, the katha sadat sagara and so forth so these were or our so called itihasas which are today we call them myths but you know they are not literally to be taken as truth you know so our notions of truth historicity etc are modern they don't go back to ancient times so what is the story of shankara it is believed he was born in 788 and he died at the age of 32 that makes it you know around uh, you know 800 and you know 10 and in these 32 years he traversed the length and breadth of india he formed four mats he unified hindus and he composed some 400 great compositions which include you know his commentary on the brahma sutras the great brahma sutra bhashya his commentary on the bhagavad gita his commentary on the upanishads and on practically everything in addition to that look at his versatility he composed so many verses songs philosophical treatises for example viveka chudamani but very popular things that i'm sure you heard as a child bhajagovindam bhajagovindam you know mss you know mudhamate and so yes. forth morning morning, morning wake, up, pray, wake up wake up prayer. wake up prayer so basically saying grammar is not going to save you you know <laughs> when death is at your door and and then he composed marvelous things like saundarya lahiri you know shiva shaktya yukto yadi bhavati shakta prabhavitum na che devam devo khalu kushala spanditum api attastvam aradhya hari har virinchadi virapi pranantum stotum va and so so here he is saying that without shakti shiva is a corpse you know even the spandana even the impulse of the universe cannot be activated without the devi and it is believed he was a great tantric you know he died in kanchi that is a belief you know and he he was born in you know kaladi he died in in kanchi and uh, all of kanchipuram is like a yantra so and then you know when he defeated mandana mishra he acquired the secret knowledge of the koka shastra or the or the erotic arts as well so in that sense i would say that uh, shankara was a, a great uh, you know 
Jnana Yogi because he said that without knowledge you can't get liberation. He was a great bhakta. His compositions are so moving, they move you to tears. And he was a great karma yogi because he established the much unified Hinduism. He was a composite individual. But frankly, you know, if you ask me as a modern critical scholar, I would say that we really don't know much about the historical Shankara. Because the Shankara Digvijayas, his hagiographies, the stories of his life from which we derive these incidents, are, are quite a few and they contradict each other. You know, one of the, uh, you know, uh, accounts of Shankara's life says he was born before Christ, before the contemporary era. That's why we have a confusion. Which Shankara are we talking about? And that's why we say Adi Shankara. There are so many Shankaras and we really don't know, you know, exactly, you know, where he was born and uh, when he was born, when he died, what were the key incidents of his life. So the same incidents get repeated. How he was caught by a crocodile. His mother wanted him to be a householder. He says, look, if you don't let me take sannyas, I'm going to die. So the mother says, okay. And then he comes back for a cremation, which a sannyas he shouldn't do. He does the last rites and he's ostracized and so forth. So, and then, you know, he defeats Mandana Mishra and he establishes the mats and all that. So many of the Digvijayas or the accounts of his life have the same incidents, but most of these are not verifiable according to modern standards. Let me give you my own example. I went to Kaladi and I saw, you know, not one, but at least two, perhaps more major memorials to Shankara. One is by the Kanchi a seven story, you know, uh, like a tower, you walk around and each story has some aspect of his life. And then you go to the Shankara Mat, which was established by the Shringeri uh, Mat. And that is on the banks of the beautiful river, you know. And uh, uh, then you, you ask, like, how, how do you know where he was born? And the account, you know, that, 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 uh, that, uh, that is given to you, you know, is that you know what, um, um, basically one of the Shankaracharyas in the last century, um, uh, you know, uh, he had an experience, you know, in that place, okay? And, uh, and uh, he felt that, uh, you know, this, uh, this, this uh, Muvattapura River, I think it is called, he had an experience that this is where Shankara was born. So he had a vision, and through that vision, he said, let's establish a matam here. And many people who go there believe that that is where Shankara was born. And I went there, and I tell you, I was transported to a different world. And on the banks of the river, I sat there, and I walked there, and, and I felt that the time had rolled back. But maybe that was my imagination. And let me tell you that when this was happening, I was, I was actually staying at another wonderful place, in Velianard, you know, near Tirovam. Now, we talked about the great Swami Chinmayananda. Apparently, uh, what, what Swamiji felt was that, how is it that uh, when a child, you know, usually among Hindus is to be born, the mother, the mother goes to um, her, her maternal home, you know, and uh, there, you know, her own mother takes care of her. So he says, you know, Kaladi was Shankara's father's home. So why would he be born there, especially in Kerala, Kerala where they have a matrilineal tradition, right? So, so Swamiji started tracing uh, the descendants of Shankaracharya's mother's family, you know, who was called Aryamba. That was what she was called. Um, and he found some living descendants. He found a beautiful Theravad. And he bought it for, for this, uh, uh, you know, uh, Chinmaya Vidya Pitam is now there. I've stayed there. And it is such a beautiful place. They have a, you know, uh, such a nice campus. And there is actually a room, a lying in room, where it is believed that the mother gave birth to Shankaracharya. And every morning they recite, uh, you know, the stotram, which I think has like a, uh, you know, composed, which, which, I mean, the refrain is, 
Bhavashankara Deshika Me Sharanam. So I take refuge, you know, in Shankara. So when you say who is Shankara, it's a complex question, you know, and I, I can say that uh, whether he was a person or not, and I believe he was a person, he was an institution. Was Vyasa a person? Everything is attributed to Vyasa. Mahabharata is Vyasa. He, he compiled or he anthologized the Vedas. That is attributed to Vyasa. You know, the Mahabharata is attributed. So now, I mean, it was one person capable of doing all this? We know that the Mahabharata itself was assembled over a period of time. So a person was not important in Hindu um, uh, philosophy or tradition. The institution was important. So Shankara is an institution, an institution which unifies Hinduism, an institution which defends Hinduism and Hindu thought, an institution which promotes scholarship, an institution in which texts are composed, commentaries are written, you know, and in which the orders of the monks perform. So Shankara is an institution. And beyond that, as I said, Shankara is self-knowledge personified. And that is why when you go to the temple, as we do the Kanchi Mahakshi. temple, there is an image of Shankara. There's a Vigraha of Shankara with his Padukas in the front. And you, you bow there, right? Because at the back, there is the, the great, uh, you know, uh, definition uh, of our Guru Parampara, you know. So, uh, it, it, you know, something like Sadashiva Prarambham, you know, Shankaracharya Madhyamam. And then you insert your own Guru, Yogi Ram Surat Kumar Paryantam, Vande Guru Parampara. So the unity of the Guru Parampara, because it is only through Guru Shishya that the knowledge of the ultimate reality is passed, as Viveka Chudamani says. And so who is Shankara? Shankara is the embodiment of compassion, which takes knowledge, which takes the form of compassion, as Dakshinamurti in the past, Sadashiva, Dakshinamurti in the past, as Shankaracharya at a certain time in history, and your own living guru, who imparts to you the wisdom of your own true nature and the ultimate reality, which saves you from the dukkha of samsara. So that is who Shankara is. Great. Um, so I think we'll have one quick question before we have, you know, we'll go to the chat box and see some more questions. So my last question to you is, what were the works of Shankara that inspired you or what were the first works that you got in touch with and really made you think deeper and critically about this whole institution called Shankara? Yes, so as you rightly said, while growing up, you hear, you hear these stotras and hymns and you don't even know that they, they are by Shankara, you know, like Nirvana Ashtakam, you know, which, which, uh, which, you know, which ends with the refrain, you know, Shivoham, Shivoham, you know. Uh, you know, Mano Buddhi Chintani, you know, um, Naham and all that. So I'm not this, I'm not that. And who am I? I am Ahankara Chittani Naham. So I am Shiva. I'm sure. So those hymns, Bhaja Govindam, other things you grow up. But, you know, I, I got into Shankara through the route or, you know, through the, I would say, uh, the kind uh, anugraha of the works of Ramana Maharishi. Because I think that his Vichara Marga, asking the question, who am I, I think took me to the heart of, of the Shankara problematic, I think. Uh, and... Uh, so th that is what influenced me. And Ramana wrote a wonderful explanation of Viveka Churamani as well. And then, you know, as I, I then I started reading to the extent that I could understand. I'm not trained in Sanskrit at all. So it's, uh, or rather, I would say I'm a failed student of Sanskrit. So whatever I, I you know, it's a little bit of self-taught stuff. But I've tried to read the Brahma Sutra Bhashas and other commentaries. I was fascinated to for example, uh, you know, study the various commentaries on the Gita and Shankara's commentary, Ramanuja's commentary, and then Abhinav Gupta's commentary. So all these are so different and, and yet so fascinating. One, is, one emphasizes uh, Gyanmarg, another emphasizes Bhakti, etc. Another emphasizes Karma. So 
What I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say to answer your question is that this engagement with Shankara is, is obviously, you know, an ongoing engagement. But I'll, I'll end by saying the most fascinating aspect of this, to me, was trying to tease out the implications of his debates with Mandana Mishra. But I think we will save that for next time. And I've even written a poem about that, about the para, Parakaya, Pravesha, and so forth. So, okay, now we'll come to some of the questions. And I think uh, I'll combine two or three questions because they uh, are, on the, are on the same theme. When it comes to the Prachanna Baudha, like you said, so, you know, can you give your uh, comments on that? And someone has also asked about uh, influence of Shankara on the Madhyamaka school of Buddh Buddhism, if any. So maybe you can combine these two. Exactly. I think, I think the point is that uh, the two questions are completely interrelated. And you see, why, why is Ramanuja calling him a prachanna bautha? Because uh, the, the argument is that Shankara is using a Buddhist dialectics, you know, and to defeat Buddhism, right? Now, uh, there are two obviously, you know, more than two, but at least two major positions that what, what Buddhism is teaching and what Vedanta is teaching are, if not similar, I mean, if not identical, then very similar, okay? And that is the position of Swami Vivekananda, that is the position of Radha Krishnanji and a number of others, that basically the Purna of Vedanta, the eternal self, indestructible and the shunya vada of of or the nirvana of uh, the, the buddhists are very similar now the other uh, approach is they are totally opposite that they are saying exactly the opposite you know and i mean there's no simple answer of what is right and what is wrong but i don't know how much time we have but i i Six minutes. Six minutes. But I'll very quickly go into the heart of this debate. You know, I took a wonderful course in Vipassana where, you know, we went very deep uh, into the layers of the mind and also the body. And uh, at the climax of the teaching or the meditative practice was, was the attempt to dissolve the body itself by negating, you know, the spinal cord as it, as it were, because they were trying to say that uh, the body is transient and anitya. So the, so, so the truth of phenomenal existence is anityata. And that's where, that is a kind of Theravadan, uh, you know, position, if you want to call it that. But that is the flaw, within quotes, the flaw, because, you know, you know these are very complex debates, that Shankara picked up. Because he said, suppose... It is anityata, which is the reality of the world. You know, Brahma Satya Jagan Mithya, let's say. Then who is it that perceives the Mithya? Who is it that perceives the anityata? There has to be an antecedent or a consciousness prior to the anityata. And so consciousness or Atman or Brahman comes before because without consciousness, nothing else can exist. Everything exists superimposed on the grounds of consciousness, which is called Adhyasa. Now the Madhyamikas, whom you yeah. mentioned, the Madhyamaks, to put it in a more correct pronunciation, Nagarjuna, he comes before Shankara. So in the history, again, history is very complicated. Mm -hmm. You don't know who comes before whom. But uh, you know what they were doing is they came up with a, with a slightly different uh, theory of uh, of, uh, of existence and reality. And they, they called it co-dependent arising, you know, what is called Pratitya Samutpada. And it's interesting how, you know, the older schools were in Pali and the newer schools, I mean, uh, you know, Mahayan Buddhism was in Sanskrit. So the debates, you know, are, are closer to Shankara by the time you get there. And so the point is that when you say Pratitya Samutpada, then neither the world nor the self is prior, but both arise together. So the answer to the question about the relationship between Shankara and Buddhism is, of course, it was a very close relationship, but ultimately depends on, you know, wh which, which side you take. For me, I don't think it's very antithetical because both are trying to free you from false consciousness. 
Okay, uh, we've got permission to carry on for a few more minutes. So the next question is, Shankara's Brahman and space can be equated. Could you give an analogy for the Thurium state of consciousness? Thurya state? I don't know whether space and consciousness are equated. Okay. This is a question mark. So yeah, I'm not you... very sure because you see, the, what happens is these become very technical terms once you start getting into debates, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, uh, so maybe I should just pass because until I understand the question and hear the person, see where they're coming from and uh, see Turiya and all, you know, the point is there are these structures that were available, you know, to us, like the Guna structure from Sankhya, you know, the, the, the four states of consciousness. You know, waking, Jagrat, you know, Swapna, Shushupti, and then Turya. So, in a way, the, the, the argument about the primacy of the self is that the self continues to exist in the waking state, in the dream state. In the dream state, nobody can say, I didn't exist. Because you get up and say, you know, I had this dream. I, I, I saw myself going somewhere, so you existed. In Shushupti, you don't remember anything, but you existed. And in Turiya also, which is the state of Samadhi or whatever you exist. So the idea is existence, I mean, consciousness is common to all states. And eventually the Advaitin will really say that death and, uh, and life are interchangeable. So consciousness exists even when you're dead. And this is actually the realization of Ramana Maharishi. At the age of 16, he had a death experience and he said, okay, now I'm dead. But uh, what's happened? My body is going cold. Soon, you know, if I don't wake up or whatever, they'll take me to the, you know, uh, Mashan Ghat uh, and so forth. But I exist, you know. So that existence of the I, which is consciousness, is perennial. So I think that is the state of Turiya. Okay. In a way. Um, we, since we brought in the modernity concept quite a bit and some of the questions are related to the frameworks through which you're actually viewing Shankara, isn't that a big obstacle today with these lenses, either the Western colonized or the Abrahamic views by which you're seeing and uh, critically examining Shankara's work? Uh, that is one. The other part is also another question I'm combining is the term Neo Vedanta was coined by Paul Hacker and which kind of is the, which, which was distinguished from the traditional Advaita Vedanta. So, I mean, uh, there, it seems to be two opposite poles when we are also using this lens and we are seeing these terms. So, what is your view? Yeah, I'll take up the Neo Vedanta idea first. There's a chapter on that in my book on, Veda, on Vivekananda. You know, look, a, a great tradition, a great parampara, you see, it flows. So as it flows, it changes. So we should not be afraid of change, of so-called modernity. But modernity for us is not an opposition to tradition, to the past. It's an evolution. Now, this whole Neo Vedanta business, Paul Hacker, where does it come from? I've traced the roots of it in my book. It actually comes from a phrase called Abhinava Vedanta. And that phrase was again traceable to Mrityunjaya Vidyalankar, who was a company within quotes Pandit. And he was a great Pandit, by the way. But when Ramon Roy started translating the Upanishads, which was not allowed earlier, you know, because you allowed in the sense that the Shruti and all was heard by a certain number of people, but the British started publishing it. He also got into the act. He did a Bengali translation and so on and so forth. So he said, this is Abhinava Vedanta. It's not the authentic traditional Vedanta. But you know, some people called even Shankara Abhinava Vedanta. So, I mean, what is authentic? What is new? These are complicated questions. Now I come to the second question about seeing everything yes, through an Abrahamic yes. lens and so forth. You know, we have become too anxious. We need not be. We have a living tradition which continues till this date. You know, like we said, Swami then and Saraswati actually taught people today. He was taught, let's say, by Swami Chanmananda, who was taught by 
Swami Shivananda, who was initiated by somebody else. And so that Guru Parampara goes back to Sadashiva. At the same time, why should we not learn from the West, you know? And wherever, you know, we find that uh, it's taking us away, you know, and it does, because there's a design, there's politics, there's Orientalism. But I can tell you this, I'm not anti-Western. I'm not an anxious modern Indian. I don't want to cleanse Hinduism. I don't believe there is some pre-colonial state to which you can suddenly be transported through a time machine. Yeah. Actually, as the great Jail Mehta said, you've got to grapple with modernity. And Hinduism is a great tradition because it has survived modernity. Many, many other traditions were destroyed. And I think this this struggle with modernity is going on. And my friends who want to be deeply authentic, you know, most of them are techies. They get their livelihood from the modern sector. And then they become extremely, extremely militant, within quotes, with due respect, when it comes to certain aspects of tradition. And, uh, but I, I don't think that is a very productive way. I think the productive way is to engage, to debate, to understand. And for me, the model of modern hermeneutics is actually Shwarabhan, who, by the way, didn't like Shankara very much. You know, so that's a different story. We can talk about it in our next engagement. Yes. But what Shwarabhan did was he didn't outrightly reject the West, but he learned from them what was to be learned, including modern philological methods, roots. He was a great scholar in Greek and Latin as well. So the idea that our tradition is the greatest it is entirely self-sufficient. We don't need references to any other knowledge system in the world. And we should continually purify ourselves and remain authentic. I don't think this is a sustainable position. A, a better position is our tradition was great. It interacted with other traditions. Sometimes it, it resisted them. Sometimes it adapted to, to different times. It was beaten down, it, it, it rose up from the ashes and so forth. And through engagements with its others, it learned. And I've actually created a framework for this on which we could end. I've said that there is the Sanatani tradition, and then there is Ko Sanatani. Ko Sanatani means it goes hand in hand with, with the Sanatan tradition, sometimes refuting it, engaging with it, debating like the Jainas, the Bauddhas, the Charavakas, the Ajivikas, etc. So Sanatani, Ko-Sanatani, then the non-Sanatani. You know, Islam is non-Sanatani. Christianity is non-Sanatani. Marxism is non-Sanatani. But the non-Sanatani can also be the anti-Sanatani. That's when we've got to get very, very careful. Then how do you defend yourself? And as I said, Shankara was a great defender of Hinduism, or call it the you know, Sanatani Parampara, call it Vedanta, call it Advaita. But he defended it, in a sense, against the Bauddhas, with whom we had a dialogue, by and large a peaceful dialogue, but not against Islam. You know, if Shankara's dates are authentic, 788, then Islam had already reached Sindh. You know, Makrana had already been conquered, you know, by the armies of the Arabs led by Mahatma bin Qasim. And I'm not sure that where is that great engagement? And the reason is that when you've got somebody who says, I'm true, my religion is true, and I destroy everything else, you can't engage with them. You have to have a different mode of engagement. So that is the yes. anti sanatani That's what, you know, is a difficult one. But with the non sanatanis you can have an engagement. And indeed, later it happened, you know, there was an engagement, you know, between Hinduism and Islam and lots of things emerged out of that. But uh, therefore, what I'm trying to say is a more productive way is not to see my tradition as entirely self-sufficient, the greatest, having nothing to learn from anybody else, but rather to see it in a dialogue with other traditions, you know, and uh, having, having a, a lot, lot to contribute. contribute and a lot to learn. I think you said it's Sambad, not Vivad. Um, so, you know, uh, just looking at the comments and questions, and you talked about learning and how are we adapting and how are we moving forward now. Um, so when we talk about the education in the current times and how we are learning, 
um, um, how do you think we can incorporate Shankara in today's summaries as the new education policy, which maybe is a little close to your heart, being a professor? And can we also have the Guru Shishya Parampara in this whole new education policy or the modern education that we call it in India and how we are struggling with it and what's the way forward? See, this is again a very complicated question because it goes to the roots of the purposes of education, right? And as I said, that Shankara was not an impractical man. He established the Mats and one of the jobs of the Mats was to defend the country. So I think a modern Shankarite would want to, you know, have an education which was both, uh, you might say, material, temporal, vyavaharika, and adhyatmaka. Now, frankly, we haven't understood how to integrate the two. We are thoroughly confused. confused. We are in doldrum, so much so that we've had a parallel board for Vedic education. Correct. So uh, I think a lot of deep thinking is required. But, you know, I think to begin with, uh, we can't, you know, throw the so-called modern, Western, whatever you want to call it, education, overboard. Remember, even in science, the Guru Shishya Parampara is very strong. If you ask a Nobel laureate, or even a great scientist, he'll say, look, I, I was taught this by my guru. We learned this, you know, you know in the lab, etc. And even in humanities, you know, we, we know our, our, our students, we are proud of our students if we train them well. So some form of Guru Shishya Parampara goes on even in modern traditions of education or Western traditions. But I think that what is really needed, I feel, till we integrate and come up with a completely new system is that we have to clean up the present system. It's full of all kinds of distortions and problems. It's very low quality. And that blah, doesn't blah. mean changing syllabus only. Syllabus change <laughs> is a part of a bigger package. Correct. But today information is so available. What we need is not to make us slaves of the syllabus. Yes. Not to say to the child, if you don't write the answer in the textbook, you will fail. That is a bigger problem. See, because then the textbook becomes a way to control the minds. We want to free the minds, right? So I'm saying that till the whole thing has changed, you know, I, I think a parallel track is important. Let's go to, you know, our own acharyas and gurus parallelly, learn chanting as you are doing, you know, have your own adhyatmic guru as many of us have had in our own ways, lucky enough. They should go parallel, hand in hand. And doesn't mean you can't go to an IIT and still study Bhagavad Gita, you can. And today in IITs, they have a wonderful Sanskrit program you yourself are taking lessons from the modules of IIT Kharagpur. So I think in time, this will evolve, but it needs deep thinking because we don't want to, uh, I think, uh, what should I say, be hasty and, uh, you know, be very rigid or extremely angry and then destroy, you know, whatever good there is uh, in the remnants of this colonized system either. So, you know, root and branch reform, yes. But, you know, step by step, slowly, with deep thought, and with, you know, committed and intelligent people at the helm, you know, of these changes. You know, not just angry activists who just want to throw things out, uproot things, smash things up, you know, and this has happened in the West and see how much they've suffered, you know. I, I happened to go to Cambridge. I, I, I was there for a month for a certain program, but I've been there several times. And when I, I wanted to go to the college where Shorabindo studied, which is King's College. And when I went there, I was told that the armies of Cromwell, you know, William Cromwell, who was this Puritan guy, who, of course, there was a Puritan revolt and they beheaded Charles I. And their armies had marched into Cambridge and they were destroying the churches, you know. And just before King's College, for some reason, they were given the order to turn back or stop. And so the beautiful painted windows, stained glass windows of King's College were preserved because the overzealous puritanical armies stopped before they destroyed them. So let's not be overzealous and puritanical, but let's be wise and deep and smart and, and think about 
these things very deeply and come up with something which is not going back to the past, right? But it's not simply going back to the past. Please, we can't. Nor can we reject the past and destroy it. The way to the future lies through the past, but it is to the future we are headed. We are not headed backwards. So we need, as Shurabandha said, new creation, not back to the past. Excellent. And I would like to end this wonderful conversation with one of uh, a question that is always very close to my heart. That what is maybe, you know, what if Shankara is, if we are all Shankaras, right? So what is Shankara's message to the youth, to the young generation who are very, very malleable and are interested about Hinduism? They don't want to reject the roots, yet they don't want to go chest thumping either. You know, they don't want to swing to either side. What is the dharmic way forward to take Hinduism? Uh, you know, in its and and to place Hinduism in its, in its rightful place, going ahead. Okay, Especially let me Hinduism. try to sum it up. The modern message of Shankara would be: Know thyself, know the world, and through knowledge of thyself and the world, try to serve and save both. Thank you so much. Thank you, Makranji. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you Academy. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your wonderful questions and comments. And uh, we are very sorry if you couldn't get to each one separately, but we tried to combine as much as possible. So apologies for any miss, uh, you know, any mistake or any misses in answering the questions. Thank you so much, uh, Makranji. Thank you so much, Gayatri ji. Uh, please don't apologize. This was such a stimulating dialogue and conversation. And all the attendees, please note, there's going to be a part two of this wonderful dialogue that they've had. And you can come back with your questions again. And that will be May 13th at the same time, 6.30 p.m. IST. Thank you once again. Look forward, look forward to having you again here.